Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to the first of the Masters of Arts Management uh, series guest speakers that we have this year. I am super excited to have Toya Lillard with us here today. But before we get to Toya, I am actually excited to have Andre Solomon and invite, uh, introduce her today. So I found out about Toya through a fantastic project that um, Andre is doing in his post ma'am alum life. And um, I wanted to bring him here to tell you and introduce you to this truly um, I can't even think of all the right words. It's exciting isn't enough, but a very exciting um, topic and a very exciting speaker. And the energy she brings to it is what is that um, it's just such a positive vibe that I think that we will all leave today um, feeling um, really empowered and like we're going in the right direction. So Andre, how are you today? I'm doing all right. How about yourself, Jessica? <laughs> oh, I just wish this were in person as I do with so many things, but I also do all, every day like to applaud all of the students at CMU who have been wearing their masks and practicing social distance and have made um, it possible for us to continue on in this semester in, our, uh, in, the, in the ways that we are, but do miss seeing you in person. So wish we were in the classroom today and, uh, and that you were doing this here, but please, if you wouldn't mind introducing um, our guest speaker today, I'd be very grateful. Yeah, so I'm gonna make this quick, a little talk about Creative Generation 2. I'm gonna read, so presenting classes, they're probably sh shaking their head at me, but time is money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, so Creative Generation works to inspire, connect, and amplify the work of young creatives who catalyze social transformation and those who are committed to cultivating their creative capabilities. So at Creative Generation, I work as the community engagement specialist um, doing a lot of community interviews, focus groups, even working for um, conferences and helping video edit. And so with the um, Creative Generation has taken up the anti-racist podcast, We Can't Go Back um, with collaboration with Courtney J. Body and Teaching Artistry. And so in that I video edit and I write all the blogs associated. Um, yeah, and so We Can't Go Back. Um, so again, with the recent uprises of the murders of George, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and the countless victims at the hands of police, the partnership formed their belief that the conversations um, on the topic of race must not only continue, but to amplify the notion that our communities cannot return to normal, but rather revise our version of the future. Uh, so the time is overdue to examine, interrogate, confront racist policies and systems founded in oppression and white super supremacy to reconnect the infrastructure of culture and diverse radical change. Um, so teaching artistry is um, with Courtney J. Body. Um, she does educational practices looking at artists and how they're navigating the world. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, kind of give you a little bio of our guest, Toya Lillard, who's amazing. And I'm like, I'm fanning all over her, she's great. So she is a theater, a director, artist, activist, and educator, a native Houstonian. Toya graduated from Houston's high school for performing arts and visual arts. She has directed plays, developed curricula, led advocacy efforts, and impl implemented innovative teaching artist training programs, both in and outside of our city schools. Prior to joining Vibe um, Theater, Toya served as director of school programming for the New York Philharmonic Education Department, where she helped to develop its nationally recognized school uh, partnership program. In addition to leading Vibe Theater experience, Toya is also part-time faculty at the New School, where she teaches global dramatic literature, diverse uh, devised theater, and Portfolio One. <laughs> Toya is also an adjunct professor at CUNY City Tech, where she teaches black theater. Toya holds a BA from Vassar College and an MA from New York University's Gallen School of Individualized Study. Toya serves on the board of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable and is an affiliate representative on the board of the Downtown Brooklyn Arts Alliance. Um, so with that, I hope you guys enjoy her. I love her. I aspire to be her. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Andre. Thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you all for showing up for class, you know. Um, <laughs> maybe you had other things to do. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, and it was really great to speak to Angela uh, beforehand, which kind of like warmed me up uh, for this talk. So firstly, um, 
All praises due to Third Ward Houston, Texas, which uh, produced me and Beyonce Knowles and Solange Knowles. So just so you know, you're in good hands. Um, we uh, have to start with that. Um, I uh, want to let you know that this talk is um, really couched and centered in my lived experience. So it's gonna be part biography, part um, memes, uh, uh, some memes in the presentation, part uh, anecdotal, and then some real hard research because oh boy, has there been so much research done about uh, these topics. All this research and no action, let's get it. So um, I'm happy that you're here. Please feel free to take notes and fact check me along the way um, because um, what I'm about to say is, um, yeah, all of it's true, uh, fortunately and unfortunately. So I'm gonna start, oh my goodness, all the Houstonians, wait, 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 let's go to the chat, let's go to chat. H-Town, hold it down from the tray, you know what I mean? Okay, Dylan, Laura, yes. Um, and I went to HSPVA, so if you're from Houston, you know PVA H, Ryan H-Town here too, okay. Um, you know, we Houstonians, the really wonderful and um, not little known thing about Houston, and this was not a part of my lecture to go on about H-Town, but we are uh, often associated with this uh, trope that uh, is associated with the state of Texas, right? So first of all, we know that like uh, racism and systemic racism, racism especially is not limited to the South, but there's this like myth that a lot of folk uh, in the Northeast like, like to like cozy themselves up to about how you know ooh, insidious it is um, somehow different in the south right so um, Houston is one of the cultural capitals of the world um, I grew up going to the museum the opera ballet uh, the Houston Symphony Orchestra it was all free I went to a, a public school uh, my high school was one of the it was the number one academically I got a top-notch public education and boom uh, Houston, Texas was one of the first uh, 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 thriving gay communities in the 1980s when there was hostility against LGBTQIA communities. Houston is one of the places where uh, Mexican Americans found a foothold and were able to really realize the dream of uh, home and property ownership and capitalism. Uh, so, uh, Mont yes, Montrose, and Montrose is where um, um, my high school was located, my alma mater. So again, um, really challenging our own tropes, the, the ideas that we were fed and some of the things that we were um, taught and socialized to believe are just flat out lies, and for a reason. Um, enough about Houston, did you ever think? Yes, confirm, confirm, no lies detected. Yeah, so the subtitle of this talk is no lies detected. Um, I challenge you to, uh, where's the lie? All right, so I'm going to share my screen and um, not yet. Um, before I share my screen, um, I have this uh, Mentimeter obsession whereby um, I love to create these interactive um, presentations um, on Mentimeter. And the problem with that is that sometimes um, I haven't properly uh, done it right. So I'm going to just stall here for a second and make sure that I have it right. Um, so Grace Lee Boggs, uh, who is someone who um, has influenced a lot of the work that uh, I talk about, um, has a, a famous saying, um, transform yourself uh, to transform the world. And so uh, this talk is also uh, partially about the transformations that uh, we all need to make in order to transform the world, in order to transform the ways that we show up in the world. All right, so here we go. Um, transform yourself to transform the world. So thinking about the um, internal changes that we can all make um, in order to position ourselves better, to show up for the movements that we wanna move in a way that does not cause harm. Grace Lee Boggs says that it has to start from within. So- Can I um, go straight cat out? 
I'll start with the I. Um, that's me at um, about four years old. Um, so you, I haven't changed much. Um, and it's one of my favorite pictures because it just really embodies, um, I was pissed off. Uh, and um, I, I was kind of born pissed off, uh, really noticing around me uh, just injustice everywhere. Uh, the ways that boys were treated as opposed to the way I was treated, all these rules um, that uh, I seemingly had to follow. Um, and so that picture is near and dear to my heart. I don't remember um, it being taken, but I definitely uh, remember uh, sort of the feeling. Houston, Texas, um, somewhere, sometime um, uh, in the past. Um, this is me, uh, my sophomore year of high school. Um, I uh, was obsessed with Oprah Winfrey and saw Oprah as the perfect representation of myself. And so um, unlike a lot of other people, I never saw myself on TV. I saw myself on TV, it was Oprah. And I was, that's it, you know, um, that's me. I wanted to dress like Oprah, be like Oprah, speak like Oprah. And when I went to school, I was treated like a problem. So um, just going back here, um, from a very early age, being very outspoken, I showed up in kindergarten, I knew how to read already. I taught myself how to read by watching Electric Company, which came on after Sesame Street. This is a true story. I was bored a lot and spoke up about it. Um, and was routinely punished. So I was a person who would get straight A's, but then a C in conduct all through school, all through school. Um, I wanna share with you a statistic. Uh, girls Leadership uh, did a study this past summer about uh, girls and leadership and the ways that, how girls feel about themselves. And it turns out that 78% of black girls higher than any other racial group see themselves as leaders. 78% of black girls see themselves as leaders and they go to school and they're treated like a problem. Later, uh, you will see how, but um, we're, we're still talking about me. Um, so sophomore year, Oprah. Um, that year, I was also accused of plagiarism by my honors uh, English teacher for an essay that I had written um, and wrote the hell out of on the crucible. He said that the language that I used, the words that I used could not have come from me. And he challenged me to challenge him. Uh, and it was very, it was a scary thing. I wanted to leave my high school, um, the high school for the performing and visual arts, the number one high school in Texas, the number one academically, number one, number one, number one, where you had to audition every year, re-audition every year, um, and give up. Thinking about the difference between what I saw in the mirror and what people um, saw, uh, how I showed up the ways that I saw myself as a leader and spoke up and out and routinely was punished. That very year, I got kicked out of Mr. Orlando's honors um, uh, history class for suggesting that Abraham Lincoln um, maybe was doing what was politically good for him at the time, you know, going to the North and preaching against slavery and going to the South and then being kind of like buddy, buddy with the plantation owners. We were studying Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass and Mr. Orlando was offended that on the last day of Black History Month, I would suggest such a horrible thing. And I was kicked out of his um, honors history class. All of this to say that my lived experience coupled with my uh, desire to make theater uh, coupled with my family's history of uh, being deeply steeped in the arts in Houston. My aunt is artistic director of the Ensemble Theater in Houston, um, which is on, an iconic uh, cultural institution um, in Houston, and dare I say, um, in the Southwest, the first Black professional theater in the Southwest. So always feeling, hmm, wouldn't it be great if, first of all, um, People didn't always tell me to be quiet. And secondly, mm, uh, noticing at every turn uh, the ways that well-meaning folks um, showing up, not having dealt with their own stuff uh, impacted me as a kid. 
always noticing uh, injustice and the ways that folk who said that they wanted to fight for freedom and were fighting in these movements sometimes showed up in a way that was counter to that. So fast forward, a bunch of boring stuff. Um, I went, as Andre told you about the schools that I went to, um, I ended up in, here in New York City um, and uh, had the great fortune of going to NYU where it seems like there's a conspiracy where like everybody who runs a nonprofit either went to NYU or Columbia, write that down. Um, how is that? Did, did everyone have a meeting or, hmm. Um, I found myself at the helm of a nonprofit organization, which to me was a lifelong dream and something that I felt I have prepared my whole life for. I spent 10 years at the New York Philharmonic building their school partnership program from three schools to 15 schools, working with 3,000 uh, school uh, teachers, partnering them with teaching artists, really doing what I thought was holistic work, but not in theater. So running uh, an organization, oh, those are my grandparents. Just to show you my, my, my grandma, I got it from my grandma, you know, the leadership piece. That's Imelda and uh, James Johnson. And they're in um, my grandma's now backyard in Houston, Texas, um, standing at that tree that still exists. Um, and I have more of her uh, actually, um, but more about that later. Um, running a nonprofit like, Vibe Theater Experience, um, which I will talk a little bit more about later, required me to um, really uh, be attuned to the conditions that um, young Black girls and young Black women were experiencing in New York City uh, and uh, in the country, but also required me to um, really recall my own lived experience and my averse childhood experiences, as they say in social work. Um, and that a lot of what I'm about to share with you, I experienced as a child and did not have the language for it, did not um, have a way to describe it. So that uh, being at the helm of an organization that served a population that um, was me years ago and also with young women who's, uh, uh, who were similarly situated um, for me uh, was a dream. Uh, and we'll talk more about how in the nonprofit sector, uh, this is seen as anything but. Um, but first, uh, did I share my... I'm sorry, I have to stop share for a second and then do it again because I didn't share my sound. Um, okay, here we go. Black girls need less nurturing, less protection, less support, less comfort. They know more about adult topics, including sex. New research shows these beliefs are widely held in the United States. A groundbreaking report from Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality finds that adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers. The study builds on previous research that found adults view black boys as less innocent than white boys, starting at age 10. The new study is the first to focus on girls and find significant adultification bias against black girls as young as five and rising through age 14. The findings may help explain why black girls face harsher treatment than white girls, both in school and in the juvenile justice system. Black girls are five times more likely to be suspended than white girls and are punished more for minor subjective offenses like dress code violations, disobedience, and disruptive behavior. Schools are more likely to call the police on black girls. White girls account for half of all girls in school, but only a third of the girls refer to police and 30% of the girls arrested. Black girls are less than 16% of girls in school, but account for 28% of police referrals and 37% of arrests. Past research has shown prosecutors drop seven out of 10 cases against white girls while only dropping three out of 10 against black girls. This data suggests bias plays a role when officials exercise discretion. Now, the new evidence that adults see black girls as needing less comfort and 
less protection, begs the question, how can we ensure that stereotypes of black women as combative and hypersexualized don't reach into our schools and playgrounds and erase childhood for black girls? Share your story, Girlhood Interrupted. So yeah, um, now um, that that is that study, the Georgetown University study was done in 2017, um, and uh, it really uncovered what a lot of folks uh, already knew, what young women in our organization had been creating theater about uh, the conditions in schools, the ways that they were perceived, the harassment that they experienced. Uh, and so being at the helm of an organization serving um, girls who were directly um, uh, speaking truth to power and policy uh, changed my life uh, and changed the way that I uh, thought about my work in this field. When I started working in this field as a young person, uh, I, of course, had the intention to do good, to work with folk who maybe had adverse childhood experiences as I did, folks who uh, saw the arts as a conduit and as a tool for change and empowering themselves. Uh, and uh, I had no idea uh, what a nonprofit industrial complex was. I had no idea how capitalist hierarchies would impact uh, my work. I had no idea the ways that white supremacy uh, would impact my ability uh, to lead. So these are a series of New York Times articles um, about um, the uh, uh, underscoring this Georgetown study, um, which basically um, says that black girls are now the most at risk group in the country. Um, so you can read that at your leisure. Uh, Vibe Theater Experience is my organization, uh, and we seek to center the lived experiences and genius art of Black girls, young women, and gender expansive youth, all through the power of the performing arts. So our folks create, write, produce, perform their own work uh, with under the guidance and with the guidance uh, and collaboration of teaching artists who are close in proximity to their age and lived experience experiences working artists in New York City. Our staff is uh, all black identified women, all under the age of 30, uh, except for me. And that will change soon. I'll talk about that later. And our board is uh, predominantly 95% of our board women of color, 80% um, black women. So much of my work at the helm of an organization that was founded well-intentioned by two graduate students at Columbia was to have it reflect its mission. And one would think that who wouldn't get behind that? You know, like, well, um, of course we want uh, all nonprofit organizations want to be mission driven and like, duh. Uh, but when I arrived um, the first day as executive director, the staff was all white, the board was all white. Um, and it was me and the girls that were the only um, people of color as far as the eye could see. And it didn't feel good. Uh, and it interested me to see sort of like what the field was like. Um, am I the only one? Uh, does anyone else see a problem? Um, so lest you think, well, what, you know, what does this organization really do? Um, this is a, a video um, that I'm gonna show just a short part of, of the latest performance that we have. We got commissioned to, um, create a performance for the grant makers in the arts. Since y'all are doing the nonprofit thing, you know, let's get some real stuff. This is real, this really happened. The grant makers in the arts virtual convening that happened this Monday, okay. Uh, we were asked to create a, the, a, a, the keynote performance, deliver their keynote performance. Um, our young women in one of our programs who I've company um, created this show in quarantine which uh, for our organization meant a lot because our folks come to vibe escaping their homes, as I just told you and shared with you all these statistics, right? So who would want to be in an oppressive environment, creating art 
uh, making oneself vulnerable. Well, I guess they did because we asked them like 25 times if it, we wish they were sure if was what they wanted to do. I was happy to spend quarantine quarantining and healing and had other plans, uh, but they wanted to finish the show. So this piece is an excerpt of that show, but also for you, an insight into what it means to really serve uh, <laughs> folks and the art that's created out of that, that real um, service. Uh, so here we go. Hello, it's supposed to play now. Why aren't you playing? Play. Play. Okay. One second. Um, this happens to me every time. I think Mentimeter is mad at me. Um, I don't know. Um, but I'm just going to go to the actual video and I'll share my screen again um, because I have it. Um, two seconds. This is so bad. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, here it is. Sorry, y'all. Um, now I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Hi, I'm Toya Lillard, Executive Director of Vibe Theater Experience. And I am Monique Latamendi, the Artistic Director of Vibe Theater Experience. We're so excited to have been invited to deliver the keynote performance for the virtual grant makers in the arts convening this year. We know something about your theme, power, practice, resilience, because like many of you, in March 2020, we had to close our doors due to COVID-19. It was important for us to check in with our folks and make I'm sure- I'm gonna fast forward a little bit because you don't need to hear me talk. Um, I just want you to hear Monique talk about the show. Oh, you said earlier, these talents and your women thought it was very important to discover the themes of self-love and self-discovery is that it's something that they've le been learning for themselves throughout the process of creating this play. So without further ado and with much excitement, here is Abrupt, God is a Black Woman. Enjoy. The important thing about ritual, any ritual, is that it's sincere and that it's not performed, right? So you have a script, you have a performance, we'll get into that, but this ritual needs to be sincere every time you do it. Love's over, flowing over, flowing I searched for God, and I discovered her, conquering all of my traumas like that shit was easy. Caught each of her tears because her buckets were big enough to hold them all. Carried my mother on her back every single piece without a break in her spine. She loved herself. Yeah, God must be a black woman. Cause that's the only person I know that receives as much disrespect as us. Doing things for self in her name. Saying it's what God will, knowing damn well that was her sister Lucy. Lucy probably tried to warn God too. Listen, don't be bending over backwards for folk who wouldn't even bend forward to lend you a hand. But God being so strong-willed and hard-headed thought it was her job to save everybody. Taking bullets in the chest with no vests just to turn around and be disrespected by those she tried to protect. God has to be a black woman because I can't understand. I can't understand why we never say thank you. We never say thank you, God. We never say, how was your day, God? We never say, God, what can I do for you? How can I be your vessel? We always say, God, you didn't answer that prayer. God, do you even know that I'm here? Are you listening? I'm reconciling with the fact that if God looks like me and acts like me, then I have to confront the fact that technically 
God is imperfect. God spoke to me today and said she's through. She said she walked me through the valley. She said she breathed into me all that her infinite lungs could exhaust. I met God last night. In a dream, I think. And she looked just like me. <laughs> yeah, a woman. Skin just as dark, dark brown like the richest soil that could bear the sweetest fruit. Oh, and her lips? <laughs> Full. And from them fell opinion after opinion, African folktale, beauty salon wisdom. <sighs> she knows herself. Much different than me, but she was so me. Oh, and her nose was wide. <laughs> like her hips, like my hips and her big legs and my big legs. Oh, and we did. God knows the cha-cha slide, y'all. And the electric slide. Oh, and we twerked. I don't know how I'm supposed to tell y'all that, but we did. We twerked. And it just, it felt like the more I was with her, the more I was sinking into myself. Energy, cells, electricity, water. A creator of a mind that wanders. Going astray of the norm. Wandering into harm. Ungrateful of present gifts. Embracing common myths. Unaware of what is embodied. Less focus and more worry. In favor of destruction, skeptical of interruption, trying to do what's best, attention aside from the test, mm -hmm. mankind. So, wanted to um, share that. Uh, as just a um, an example of the sort of art we're creating in COVID-19, right? Um, typically we would be on stage, these productions would be staged, fully produced. Um, and this is the iteration, this is what it means for us to um, make art in uh, COVID-19. So just um, just wanted to give you a snippet of sort of an example of what the uh, artistic um, uh, work of Vibe entails. This means um, radical honesty, transparency, um, and that our young women have ownership over uh, their art and the process at all times. What does this have to do with um, the nonprofit industrial complex, or uh, as we know uh, it to be. Uh, what does this have to do with the topic of um, abolition? What does it have to do with uh, racial equity? What does it have to do with arts management? Um, so I, I want us to um, remember the statistics that we now know. I want us to remember the history that I shared with you. I want us to remember all of that as we go into um, talking about what uh, we understand to be the nonprofit industrial complex. So um, in this piece, this essay, uh, the nonprofit industrial complex is hold on social justice. Uh, Jennifer uh, Samimi says, people working for social justice in the United States today are limited by the dysfunctional funding system that sustains most nonprofits. Um, what? Huh? Don't you just like write grants and everybody, you know, means well and you get a 501c3 and you do good in the world, the good that you say you're going to do in a five. What dysfunctional funding system? What does that mean? I want us to think about that for a minute. Um, what does that mean? Um, what are these dysfunctional funding systems? Um, and what in the world is a nonprofit industrial complex? Um, so we see here um, this chart, uh, which is sort of a graphic description, uh, one person's sort of graphic description of what the nonprofit industrial complex might be, whereby wealthy capitalists, that's like rich people, that's like 
rich people. That's the one percent um, that we talk about all the time. Steal wages to make profit. Stealing what? Um, again, this is an iteration of thought of how it might be. But wealthy people who are have become wealthy and have become wealthy through capitalist ventures, one should say, um, then divert money out of public funds into tax, tax sheltered foundations. So this is the part that we don't really talk about. We hear, we're socialized to believe that wealthy people are um, altruistic and that they wanna, um, because they've become wealthy, they have a modicum of, 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 of money that they wanna give back, that they wanna give, that they wanna give back and give and be altruistic. And so foundations are formed by wealthy folks um, in order to continue to do good in the world and to fund um, that good in the world. What we don't talk about is the fact that there are tax shelters, um, that a lot of these funds are um, attached to the stock market and hedge funds and all of the unsavory um, um, entities that we talk about dismantling. Many of us go into the field wanting to do good, um, attaching ourselves to nonprofits that seem like they're really successful at doing good because why would they, they wouldn't have $50 million if they didn't do good only to find out that there are people upset with our nonprofit. <laughs> what, why? Um, that there are people um, who say that our nonprofit is doing harm. How? Well, this is one way. Um, not understanding how tax shelters function and feed um, philanthropy uh, and also not understanding how that feeds our field and the decision-making that happens within it. So if you control a foundation as a wealthy person who has become wealthy because of, of capitalism and capitalist hierarchies, um, you, would, you would think ostensibly that you would wanna stay wealthy um, and do the things that it would take to stay wealthy, uh, which is a, a rub here, thereby controlling dissent through the grant making process. So, hey, don't give it too much. So you're not really funding revolutions because the fund of revolution means that uh, 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 I might not be as wealthy. Mm, 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 mm. I'm going to fund your after school program. And I'm not funding this. What do you say you're doing? No. Um, our grant making doesn't extend to that. Um, which then makes money um, and uh, benefits um, this system. And uh, this iteration is saying, you know, it keeps us down. Us being um, the folks who are not a part of the ruling class, the folk who are endeavoring to do good, the folk who are um, on the bottom, the practitioners, the teaching artists, the folk who work in the office, um, anybody who is not here. Um, so the nonprofit industrial complex mirrors the prison industrial complex um, in the ways that it relies upon systems that we swear need to be dismantled in order to function. I wanna pause there because I've given a lot of information and have us think about um, this nonprofit industrial complex in relation to Grace Lee Boggs, in relation to our own lived experience in relation to the reckoning that's happening in this country. We see articulations of an intention to do good. And we see the impact of those entities being wrapped up in systems that don't do good. If we continue to assume that it is because of altruism that our favorite foundation was formed, that it was because of saviorism that 
our favorite foundation has to have certain folk at the helm. How far do we push the needle towards change? So I wanna ask you how much, since you're scholars and all, how much do you know about the nonprofit industrial complex? Not how much you read about it, cause that's boring. <laughs> What do you know? What have you lived? Not what you've read. We've all read a lot. I mean, that's why we're here. What do you know? What is your lived experience, right? I showed you my baby pictures and my story and I related it into this nonprofit industrial complex. So I wanna, what are your baby pictures? What's your story? How do you relate into this um, nonprofit industrial complex? Not what you have read because that's boring. What do you know? What have you lived? What is in you? What have you embodied? <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Uh, you said you can go ahead. Um, the, the, the last point that you brought up about, or the last point that was, they brought up and mentioned in the, in the, in the cartoon regarding, um, having the, you know, pro having the proceeds from like capitalist ventures going into, um, like, you know, a, a philanthropic front. Um, I grew up in the Silicon Valley, so a lot of tech companies were uh just pouring money into uh like organization like into organizations that they ran to give to elementary schools to like be able to like have people go to have kids go to museums and get that sort of cultural education um and as a kid i you know was like oh i, I didn't think about oh why is google giving the school district like millions of dollars to be able to go to this like big fancy tech museum um and it wasn't until working in a museum and like sort of getting some insight into what the what the uh, like where a lot of a lot of donations and grants and funds come from to to fund specific exhibits that i kind of start to see the nefarious side of of that kind of philanthropy thank you for that how do you even start a nonprofit anyway i mean can anyone start a nonprofit i mean Anyone can start a nonprofit, but who typically starts a nonprofit? There's this, there's a, there's a very specific narrative here in New York City. Um, um, anybody have any idea? Maybe you all want to start a nonprofit as soon as you graduate. Maybe that's like the first thing on your agenda. Boom, start a nonprofit um, because you want to do good in the world because you've gone to school and all and yeah people without student loans absolutely people with family wealth absolutely people who have the money to start one intergenerational wealth absolutely and if you're in new york city you better gone to nyu what does nyu have to do with it toya detect the lie NYU and Columbia, those are the two institutions. NYU and Columbia. It's changing, it's changing, it's changing. Little by little, slowly but surely, a change is gonna come. But for now, <laughs> it's NYU and Columbia. Guess where I went to school? <laughs> oh, Andre already told you. Where's the lie? Um, the names hold weight, the donors like to see, they appear to connotate a yes, Grace, hello, Grace. That's right, NYU, Vassar. It offsets that mistrust and disbelief I talked about earlier. 
But what if I didn't go to NYU? What if I didn't go to Vassar? Would I be sitting here right now? Would you even be listening to me right now? Probably not. That is the, what we mean by the nonprofit industrial complex. The system through which most folks who start a nonprofit have generational wealth so they don't need a day job, so they can go without a salary, so that they can spend a year raising money and getting a 501c3, and they know a lawyer already that can give them pro bono help for their 501c3. They've got 20 college friends that'll sit on their board initially. All of those friends will give a good, you know, 10K to start, maybe 20, I don't know. Yeah. That's how your favorite nonprofit was started. To do good, yes. But based upon a foundation that is tied directly to the elite and to the 1% that we talk about. Rarely do you see someone who comes out of a community that they serve start a nonprofit without the support of somebody like what we just described. So absolutely, you've got your Russ Moore at Robin Hood. Absolutely, you've got your nonprofit leaders, but they are being supported and lifted up by people who are attached. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. Let's talk about your favorite nonprofit's board of directors. Oh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Oh, my. Whoa, wait a minute. Well, people will say, well, uh, 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 the board of directors is a fiduciary responsibility, fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility. This, again, only feeds and supports what we know as a nonprofit industrial complex, which keeps things exactly the way they are. So if you've got the same people who are attached to that wealth on your board, how much revolution are you revolving? <laughs> Right? That's why you don't have poor people on boards or like people who are like the same lived experience as your constituents or the people you serve on your board. <laughs> Never. Never. But diversity, equity, inclusion, the musical. Um, we understand that, yes, nonprofit boards create their own echo chamber. The nonprofit industrial complex creates its own echo chamber that shows up in a way that creates a barrier to change and under supports and under funds the organizations that are um, affecting change and serving people. Yes. Um, Thank you. It's 12.33. I have until, don't I have until um, one o'clock? Wait, how long do I have? Yes, you definitely have until one o'clock. Oh, um, I was just letting you know, sometimes people like to know when they're about halfway. I do, and I'm, I'm glad. All right, so back to, um, back to the mentee. Thank you for that. Um, so no, that's not it. Why do I do this? Um, we're gonna go back to our Mentimeter, if I can find it again. Oh, here we are. Um, and we stopped here. Whoa, this was pretty heavy. But now it's not so heavy, right? Now we're like, oh yeah, I get it now. <laughs> See, that's why we have to talk it through. Now you're like, mm, boom, absolutely, natch. Um, so this leads to, this is something that I, um, uh, this was a Facebook post that I made in June. Philanthropy.com came out with this article Eureka! Nonprofits led by people of color win less grant money with more strings. Breaking news at five. And um, as I said, you know, we already we already knew that. No one talked to me. Um, but my friend Robin Walker Murphy um, always says um, in our field, uh, in conversations, uh, if a black woman says two plus two equals four, everybody wants to pull out their calculator. Um, and that's been my leadership story. Um, I've been saying two plus two equals four all this time and funders, wait a minute. Uh, uh, uh. What did you say? Water is wet. Um, 
which mirrors the distrust and misbelief that we talked about earlier in Girlhood Interrupted. It follows you into adulthood is what I'm trying to say here um, in, a, in a more entertaining way. Um, I put the link in the bottom. You can look it up, philanthropy, you know, but the title, it's all in the title, boom. Um, EDI, the musical, look, it, it really should happen. Um, so I have all of the text for what should go into EDI, the musical. So these are all New York Times articles talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, so in 2015, they were like, mm, we, go, we plan to study these cultural organizations and, and, and diversity. We plan, we plan to study them. And then in uh, 2016, they're like, we studied and less than 35% of cultural institutions in this melting pot of New York City, this, your, this beautiful oasis of diversity, um, less than 35% of cultural organizations uh, have black leadership. Only a fraction of that, women. You're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> me and a handful of other uh, Black women in New York City, the, the cultural mecca of the world. And then in 2019, they were like, boom. Now we know there's a problem. Wait a minute, y'all, in 2016, you did the study. In 2019, they said, hey, we know there's a problem. What should we do? <laughs> what do you mean? And maybe you all have heard of the DEI initiatives uh, uh, that have happened all over um, cultural organizations and higher education. Um, and so New York City came up with what it called a cultural plan for New York City. Uh, problem was, it didn't really include any power shifts. It really didn't include um, leadership that looked any different than it did. And this is how um, capitalist hierarchies, the nonprofit industrial complex, and what we are witnessing in America um, show up when we don't um, do the internal work, when we don't examine our implicit biases, if, when we don't examine our positional power, our relationship to capitalism. Um, we talk about equity, we talk about diversity, we talk about inclusion, and we don't include anybody because it makes us uncomfortable. <laughs> um, we don't include any more people than it, our comfort allows. And we love diversity, but I'm not giving up my job for it or one penny to make it happen. This is how it has shown up in this country and this is how it's shown up in our field. So then what? Um, an example, if you don't believe me again, where's the lie? I want you to detect the lies. Our biggest funder, Vibe Theater Experience, Novo Foundation. Uh, this is an article from Inside Philanthropy. Heartbroken and stunned, Novo's program upheaval sows anger and uncertainty. What does that mean? That means that Novo Foundation, who had been dedicated to Black girls and transforming the lives of Black girls and supporting the organizations that work within communities that support Black girls and young women, pivoted and divested and decided they woke up on a Wednesday um, Peter Buffett, Peter and Jennifer Buffett and decided, ah, black girls, we want to do something else. So they sent us all a letter, nice letter saying that they decided ah, to pivot. This happened to be the same month that George Floyd was murdered. We've decided to pivot, maybe the environment, we don't know yet. We actually, mm, we don't know yet, we're not sure. They're not even sure, but they're pivoting. Uh, forget our number. We don't know you anymore. Peace. Good luck. Black Lives Matter. This is what happens. This is what happens. Where's the lie? Moreover, as this uh, my favorite tweet says, um, a lot of y'all are Amy Coopers to the black women in your nonprofits every day, I'm just saying. How rude, what? Who's doing that? Mm. Well, if we think about it and we do the math and we think about these hierarchies, we think about the nonprofit industrial complex, its proximity to Wealth, its proximity to capitalism, um, its proximity to the very people who 
are showing up to work on behalf of communities, then you understand how um, a lot of your favorite nonprofits are operating in a way that is oppressive and that only replicates the harms that they say they want to address and dismantle. Sticky, tricky stuff. Here's a joke. What's the academic version of thoughts and prayers? Diversity and inclusion. For real though, there's white parents taking their children to Black Lives Matter protests who refuse to take their children to the predominantly black schools in their gentrified neighborhoods. This is concerning. What does this have to do with abolition, Toya? Oh my goodness, what? My head hurts. Good. Um, so how do we address this, um, these systems that seem insurmountable, this field that we want to serve, the barriers that are in place, the power and privilege that, that we hold as individuals and our desire to show up in community. What does abolitionism have to do with it? And why is this lecture titled Nuggets of Free? Why do we have to settle for nuggets? We'll get to that later. But first, we take the name abolitionist purposely from those who called for the abolition of slavery in the 1800s. Abolitionists believed that slavery could not be fixed or reformed. It needed to be abolished. As prison industrial complex abolitionists today we also do not believe that reforms can make the prison industrial complex just or effective. Our goal is not to improve the system, it is to shrink the system into non-existence. So we take this definition of abolitionist and apply it to our work. Does that mean we destroy our own field? No, no. It means that we fortify, reimagine, rethink, regrow, shift our field into something to believe in. We take a cue from Harriet Tubman who freed herself only to go back and spend her life trying to free others. Now she could have just stopped and said, oh, too bad you guys are still enslaved. But no, an abolitionist's job is to seek freedom. That means free myself from my internalized racial inferiority, free myself from this positional power and free others and free others. That means that the hyper-competitive nature of our field that has to shrink into non-existence. Saviorism has to sh shrink into non-existence. Capitalist hierarchies cannot be applied to this work. So we're not treating our favorite nonprofit like it's a business. We're not treating the people we serve as products. An abolitionist framework requires us to place at the center those who are most in need. In this country, we already know, we already, we already know. That means that we center the freedom of folk who are most in need. Um, and as folk go who are most in need, we also include the idea and the fact that gender in itself is a social construct. So for our purposes, we should be centering Black trans women. We should be centering the folk who are differently abled. We should be centering the people who have not been listened to. All under this umbrella of abolition. Can we do it in the nonprofit industrial complex? Can I? 
I'm just here for an arts management degree. I mean, I don't know, did I sign up for all of that? I don't know. So this is one idea. This comes out of the um, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And this is a manifesto, 10 rules to fight for Black people's freedom. This is an example, right? Show up in defense of Black people. If you are a non-Black person of color, it is your responsibility to call out anti-Blackness and white supremacy in your community. If you are a white person, read up on what it means to be actively anti-racist. And you all know, there's books. Center Black voices and demands. Join an organization. Be willing to be wrong and learn and to grow. Learn your country's history and prevent it from repeating itself. For us, that means learn our sector's history. Entering into this field without understanding the history in every city that you say you're planning to move to Austin. Well, you need to learn about how the nonprofit industrial complex has shown up in Austin, Texas, right? Wherever you decide to live, doing the research and understanding how these systems have worked is important. Know your rights. Uh, this defund the police piece I want to talk about because um, we've been there, there's been a lot of talk um, uh, about the election and exit polls and um, there's been a lot of talk about this idea of defunding the police being the reason why um, some people voted um, in a way, uh, in another way, and I want to just name that um, a part of this conversation is not necessarily um, eradicating, right, uh, but rethinking and um, making our making sure that our institutions are functioning in a way that does not further cause harm. So that is my interpretation of that iteration. Um, and I invite you to think more deeply about it as well and not take it at face value. That also means um, measures like community care rather than, um, the, rather than policing. Um, the ending of policing in schools whereby black girls are sent home and dress coded for what they're wearing when they haven't caused harm. Uh, learn about the abolition movement and the reparations movement. Um, keep dreaming, hope, and going. Um, this is just an example of how it might be applied in our field. Um, lastly, I want to share with you this quote, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. Um, now, um, we're going to do a word cloud together. Um, if you haven't already, some of you have, go to www.menti.com, use the code 9216609, and uh, begin to populate this word cloud. Going back to the first slide, Grace Lee Boggs said, transform yourself to transform the world. Um, we've talked a lot about um, the ways that our field um, is wrought with the need for change. We've talked a lot about how personal transformation is important to this work. What personal changes or transformations do you wish to make in order to change the world? Let's go. We've got listen, humility, learn. Compassion, awareness, empathy, decenter myself, act. acceptance, knowledge. So the great thing about this word cloud is the words that are in the largest text represent what we as a community have together. That means that more than one or two people have um, submitted that word. So right now, the words that are emerging as our common uh, desire in terms of personal transformation, compassion, humility, Awareness, knowledge, empathy, love, decentering, listen, action, engage. As we populate this, uh, make space, love, break patterns, speak up, co conspirator, open minded. This is what this community desires, the personal transformations that this community is naming that will help each of us show up in community to transform this world, which is what we are here to do. I'm going to um, make sure to send this 
uh, word cloud uh, um, to you folks after this um, so that you can have it and so that each of you can see and remember it and hold it dear. But I'm going to um, stop the screen share um, and really thank you for um, holding space. And I want to hold space for your questions, comments, thoughts, um, while we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, my thing, um, my jam, my mantra is that we are all duty bound to heal um, in order to show up in a way that is useful to ourselves, to others, uh, and the world. <laughs>